almost two Sydney women a week are converting to Islam. Wow. She responded. Oh my God, what do I do? He keeps his uh, what, uh, and I could be aggressive this time and then maybe she won't respond again. You think you can just make a video response? Uh, that's probably not going to work. Hmm. Maybe I could tell people to dislike her video. But then she's just going to get rid of her dislike bar. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? <gasps> I'll just respond how it tells me to respond in the Quran. Oh, there we go. When the ignorant address them, they say words of peace. I'll respond using words of peace. I knew you would know the answer. I noticed you were clearly upset that I didn't respond to most of the claims that were made in your previous video. Well, you see, the same way you quickly dismiss the comments of Krauss because he's not your prophet, I too will dismiss any unreferenced claims about Islam that have nothing to do with my prophet nor my holy book. But nevertheless, I see that you've learnt from your mistakes this time and actually try to pick out a few quotes from the Quran and the Prophet through the use of Wiki Islam, your online source on Islam that anyone can edit. Real authentic. How about we start with this? The real authentic source on Islam that no one can edit, nor has anyone been able to in the past 1400 years. Now, although you haven't got any qualifications in Islamic scholarship, the Quran, Arabic, nor even in the sciences of Hadith to be fairly commenting on either, I'll be using this video as a means of basic education, not only for yourself, but for the vast majority of people that are actually interested in learning the truth. So let's begin. Now, in regards to the marriage of Aisha, we've already answered this before. But since I'm now responding to an atheist who doesn't believe in God and therefore has no objective code of morality, you are in no position to objectively determine what is the morally acceptable age of marriage in a 6th century Arabian desert, especially when the only morals you hold are those that are subjective and constantly changing over time in accordance with new ideas, opinions and cultures. So something that is wrong for you today, just as well might be right for you tomorrow. Example, consensual incest. While on the other hand, we do have our own objective moral code, which not only prohibits incest, but also prohibits the consummation of marriage with any individual who has not yet reached maturity. So despite her age, she was mature. People try to tell me that back then, kids actually grew fast. Are you kidding? No, we're not kidding you. The French philosopher Montesquieu, who just like yourself was a staunch critic of Islam and religion in general, stated in the spirit of laws, which was used in developing the American constitution, that in hot climates, women are marriageable at eight, nine, or 10 years of age. While by the age of 20, a woman will be considered old. So if you do want to comment on the prophet's marital relations, Please learn your history. Now in regards to the comments of the flying spaghetti monster, we're Muslims. And if you know anything about Islam, you would know that Muslims believe that there is no God. No man God, no animal God, no idol, no statue, not even a holy trinity. Nothing except the one and only creator who is outside the scope of time, space and matter. Unlike anything imaginable and the absolute cause of the beginning of this universe. Now since everything else that begins requires a cause, Believing in a cause for our universe is not only a rational belief, but a natural belief. While believing that something can come from nothing is not only unnatural, but requires a gigantic leap of faith. You then move on to criticize the doctrine of jihad, which we have already addressed before. So in case you don't know what jihad means, let me teach you, because it might just interest you to know that I'm actually performing jihad right now. Jihad against ignorance. See, the word jihad, when translated from Arabic, means struggle. Whether it be a struggle against oppression, corruption, injustice, poverty, hunger, and of course, ignorance. See, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the best jihad is a word of truth in the face of a tyrant ruler. For he was a man that would perform jihad both physically and financially. A man who would never say no when asked to give in charity, even if it meant that he would have no food left over in his house and was to fast the entire day. And even when he did, he would never let the night fall until he had ensured that there was no food or wealth left over, except that it was given away in charity. And by the way, following the doctrine of jihad, Muslims have been labelled as the most charitable people in the entire UK. But then again, yes, as expected, jihad is also physical fighting. 
Now, although Islam is a peaceful religion, Islam is not a pacifist religion. It is a religion of realism that recognizes that evil does indeed exist in this earth, whether it be tyrant regimes that drone entire cities or cruel dictators that besiege towns under army blockades, leaving people starving to death. So for this reason, Islam made physical force permissible to defeat evil. However, since Islam is a religion of peace, physical force too comes with strict conditions and ethics to prevent unnecessary harm. Now to the doctrine of martyrdom. You see, it sounds so scary when we don't know what it's talking about. So let's find out exactly what it's referring to. According to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he who dies while defending either his property, his life, his faith or his family is a martyr. And quite frankly, there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, those who have died while defending such causes have always been labelled as heroes, not only in Hollywood, but in real life. So what difference does it make when they're Muslim? Oh wait, Muslims get paradise. Isn't that a good thing? Let me put it to you this way. Both you and I are standing in a country where the citizens are being oppressed. Both you and I are here because we love to help people. But what happens when in order to help people, there is a strong possibility that the two of us are going to die. Now while many others would favour the safety of their own lives and choose to run away, a Muslim would have the incentive to stay and actually help others, hence making Muslims more effective in protecting the vulnerable. The religion of peace. But what about apostasy? See, if you knew anything about Islam, you would know that Islam is not only a religion that governs the lives of individuals, but also society in general. When there is an Islamically governed society, Islam should have rules in place to protect its citizens and its borders. And apostasy, as understood by many leading Islamic thinkers, was not to limit freedom of private and personal conscious decisions, but rather to prevent acts of rebellion and treason against the state. If you look into the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him, you would realize that not a single person was killed for merely changing his or her private religion, but only once they came out publicly in an act of treason and treachery, cooperating with the enemies to either harm the Muslims or harm Islam, were they ever punished. And even before this could even take place, they are afforded a fair trial and hearing before a court, where in most instances, they are afforded the right to repent and be granted forgiveness. You see, Islam was practicing the rules of natural justice and open hearing, along with leniency before such legal codes were even introduced. And it was for such reasons that Muhammad, peace be upon him, earned his title as one of the greatest lawgivers of all time. And in all honesty, capital punishment for the act of treason is nothing new. Matter of fact, it's still happening today in the very country you yourself are living in, whereby your own citizens could and would most likely be killed for treason and conspiracy against the state. And as much as you try to label Islam as a religion that kills people on the basis of being non-Muslim, there are 1.7 billion Muslims alive today with one in four people being Muslim. So if this really was the case, don't you think we would all be dead by now? See, the Quran actually permits us to be kind to non-Muslims. So as long as they A, don't try to fight and kill us because of our religion and B, don't try to drive us out of our homes. That's a pretty fair deal. And even still, the Quran on multiple occasions highlights the importance of forgiving those who do wrong to you. Look into the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him. For instance, in the conquest of Mecca, whereby he entered a city which had persecuted, tortured, boycotted, and even tried to assassinate the messenger on multiple occasions. Yet he entered the city with his head lowered, stating that today is the day of forgiveness. Now, your final comment. There's highly destructive technology out there and one person can ruin the lives of millions. Okay, this is when it gets a bit creepy. But we don't have five or six hundred years to figure this out. What exactly are you insinuating? Because it sure sounds to me that you're reiterating the exact same thoughts and sentiments that the award-winning atheist Sam Harris used to justify his suggestion that a preemptive nuclear strike on the Muslim world killing tens of millions of innocent civilians in a single day is justified. Which is funny since history clearly shows that the only one who has actually used nuclear weapons in the past is the very country you and Sam call home. And you could go ahead and disassociate yourself from such comments and actions as much as you like, but the fact of the matter is, a godless society caters for such ideas, whereby tyrannical governments play the role of God and do what they wish, when they wish, being held accountable to no one but themselves. This is exactly why we've seen atheists such as Stalin commit the atrocities he did, and this is why we saw Christopher Hitchens support the illegal Iraq war, which led to the deaths of over a million people, including over 500,000 in children. So before you want to talk about Islam serving a risk to humanity, please have some humility. Islam is not a threat to humanity. Islam is a mercy to humanity. Islam is peace and no matter what you say or how you say it, we will continue spreading peace.